This video introduces factorial analysis of variance, or ANOVA, which is a technique that you might use to evaluate whether some continuous outcome differs significantly between groups when those groups are based on two or more variables. So for example, does the amount of nitrate removed differ significantly between groups based on both material type and on two different levels of added phosphate? So you have soil at high phosphate, soil at low phosphate, wood chips at low phosphate and at high phosphate, for example. Each has its own group mean. We want to know, do those group means differ significantly from each other? So factorial ANOVA obviously has similarities with regular ANOVA, technically called one-way ANOVA, um, in that both of them divide the total variance into portions that are explained by the independent variable, this is the between groups mean square, and a remaining portion that's unaccounted which is called the within groups mean square. The statistical significance is calculated as the ratio of those two portions. But there are also similarities with multiple regression. Both techniques consider multiple independent variables, as well as potentially interactions between those variables. The difference is that multiple regression has at least one continuous independent variable, but that difference is much smaller than you might guess, as you'll learn by the end of this video. So what do you need for factorial ANOVA? Well, first, you need one continuous dependent variable, also called the outcome or the response. You want to know if this variable differs significantly among all the groups. Second, you need two or more independent variables, also called factors, groupings, predictors. Uh, these should be categorical and not continuous. They should have two or more levels in, in each of them. Third, the observations must be independent. And this typically means that you shouldn't have repeated measurements made on the same objects. If you do have that, well, you'll need to use a repeated measures ANOVA, which isn't covered in this video. Fourth, the dependent variable must be roughly normally distributed, which means more or less symmetrical and unimodal for each combination of the groups. The test isn't that sensitive to this, unless there's a, a, a good amount of, of skew in, in some of the variables. And fifth, the variance of the dependent variable should be roughly similar for each combination of groups. This is technically called the homogeneity of variances. So also note that the sample sizes end up being quite important, but there'll be much more on that later on. So what does factorial ANOVA do? Well, the first test is for the, the main effect, or the main effects. Whether there are significant differences between the means when grouped by each of the independent variables. So in our example, this could ask whether the mean of soil differs significantly from that of wood chips, whether the low phosphate mean differs significantly from the high phosphate mean. And the null hypothesis, as is common with null hypotheses, are that the group means are not different from each other, or that they come from populations with the same mean. The second thing that can be assessed is whether, there's, as a, whether there is a significant interaction between the, the, the factors. Uh, and this is where the mean difference is constant across all levels of the independent variables. And so the graph on the left shows an example with, with no interaction. The shift from low to high phosphate causes the same change in nitrate regardless of material. The shift from soil to wood chips, likewise, causes the same change in nitrate regardless of whether it's low or high phosphate. However, the graph on the right does show an interaction. Different combinations give you different outcomes. The effect of phosphate is much larger in wood chips than it is in soil. The effect of switching to wood chips is much larger when phosphate is high than when it's low. So the process of how this works is actually very similar to one-way ANOVA. The total variability, variance, or sum of squares, is first partitioned into the between groups component, which basically measures the differences between the group means. Smaller differences, meaning it's more likely that they came from the same population, bigger differences, meaning that's less likely. There's also the within groups component, which sort of measures, basically measures the scatter within the groups. But because there are multiple independent va variable factors, the between groups variance is further partitioned into the, into the sum of squares for each factor, as well as the interactions. And finally, the statistical significance is assessed using f-tests on the ratio of the between groups mean square for each factor relative to the within groups mean square. So there end up being an f-test for each factor and each interaction that you're 
test might include. So how do you interpret the results? Well, if none are statistically significant, you can only say there's no significant difference and then no further action is required. If the interaction is significant, it's difficult to interpret the, the regular main effects because the effect of one factor depends on the value of the other. Instead, you can investigate something called the simple main effects, and that is the effect that one factor has at a constant level of the other factor or factors. So in the, in the two key tests, these are shown in a big list at the, the bottom of the output, um, along with some other pairwise comparisons. And the simple main effects are in, in the boxes there. For example, we have the, uh, a f the difference in means between wood chips and soil at the constant level of low phosphate, the difference in between high and low phosphate at the constant level of soil samples, and, and so forth. Well, if the interaction isn't significant, you can look at the regular main effects that are reported in the main output. You may also want to investigate the pairwise contrast using a two-key test like you would with a, a regular one-way ANOVA. Now, in, in factorial ANOVA, there can be a lot of possible comparisons, uh, even more so when the factors have more than the two levels in this, in the, we're using in the example here, or when there are three independent variables or, or more. So factorial ANOVA can get really complex. And what you end up reporting will depend on the scientific questions that you're trying to answer. But in general, as, as with sort of all these tests, there's two components. The first is the effect size. How important is the independent variable? This is really crucial, and it's measured by looking at the means of the samples and especially at the differences between sample means. And this is what we really care about. We want to know how big of an effect does something have. You should also report the statistical significance, and when you do that, give for any test that has it the F statistic, the two degrees of freedom, and the p-value for that test. And this basically tells us not how important the effect is, but how likely it is to have occurred if the null hypothesis was true. So it gives us some sense of how unexpected or surprising this effect is. And so you should report all the statistical results for the primary test. Don't omit any factors or interactions when reporting your summary. Um, if you run a test with Two factor, three factors and an interaction, don't then just report two of them because that is going to sort of skew your results and, and potentially run into problems with researcher degrees of freedom. Okay, so here's the big, big caution about sample size that I, I briefly mentioned towards the beginning. So factorial ANOVA gets complicated when sample sizes are unequal. So it really works best for experimental data where you can control and make sure that every combination has the same sample size. So that's our best case scenario, the balanced design. All sample sizes are equal, all combinations of independent variable factors have, in this case, 20 samples, the same number in all of them. If the sample sizes are unequal, the design is no longer balanced, it's called unbalanced now, and so the medium case, the second best case, is unbalanced but still proportional. So the sizes are different, but there's consistent ratios between the factors. So for example, wood chips in this example always have one and a half times as many samples as soil. High phosphate is always twice as many samples as low phosphate. The worst, but probably most common, type of unbalanced design is the unbalanced and disproportional design where everything's unequal and there aren't constant ratios. So this is probably what you'll run into if you have unbalanced data. But why are unbalanced designs problematic? Well, when the design is balanced, that means that each factor is independent of the other factors. There's no correlation between them. But you might be wondering, well, how can, what do we mean by correlation? The factor levels are words, like soil or wood chips or, or low or high. Well, imagine we convert them to numbers. So we give soil a zero, we give wood chips a one, zero for low phosphate, one for high phosphate, so forth. We can then plot the data, and you can see that there are 20 zero zeros, 20 zero ones, 20 one zeros, 20 one ones. Um, there's no correlation. All four have 20 data points in them. But when the design is unbalanced and disproportionate, there ends up being some correlation between the different factors. So we'll convert them to 0 and 1 again, 
But now we only have 10 data points in the lower left 0, 0 category. There's 15 in the 0, 1, there's 20 in the 1, 0, and there's 25 in the upper right category with 1, 1. That's wood chips and high phosphate. So there's some correlation here. For example, if we know that the material is soil, which is 0 on the horizontal axis, we also know that it's a bit more likely that phosphate will be high. If we know that phosphate is high, we also know that we're more likely to be looking at wood chips. So why is this a problem? Well, the correlation between factors means that it's impossible to accurately partition the sum of squares. Because we know, you know, just knowing something about whether it's wood chips or soil tells us some information about a different factor, they're, they're intertwined in some way. We can't distinguish them fully. So consider the, the balance design. There's no correlation between the variables or their interaction, so these, these circles in a schematic way, show the sum of squares for each. The larger purple circle is the sum of squares for the material, wood chip or soil. The medium orange circle on the right is the sum of squares for phosphate, low or high. And the smaller circle with the color gradient on the bottom is the sum of squares for the interaction. And they don't, they don't, there's no correlation, so they're all independent. They're all their own circle. There's no overlapping. In an unbalanced but proportional design, there's no correlation between the two variables. They don't overlap, but there is some correlation with the interaction. So those circles overlap a little bit. And I won't talk much more about this. But we will focus more on the unbalanced and disproportional design. Um, there's correlations between the variables and with the interactions. Those are all indicated with the overlapping of these circles. So some of the overlapping area means that the sum of squares for the material and the phosphate are correlated with each other. Some of that should go to the purple circle and some to the orange factor, but it's impossible to know how much goes to each. So there's a couple ways to deal with this. One is just a caution is that the default ANOVA functions in R partitions the sum of squares in a sequential way, which I'll show in a second. This is called the type one sum of squares. And this causes problems because the results that you get depend on the order that the variables are entered into the function. Obviously, this is not a good thing. So in this function, material is first, so it gets all of its sum of squares. When, you, when they're partitioned, they're first partitioned by saying how much is explained by material. And then the next step is to say how much is explained by phosphate taking into account we've already used some of the sum of squares for material. So phosphate gets kind of the remaining ones. Then finally, interaction gets what's, it, what's left over. But if you swap the order and put phosphate first, well, phosphate gets all of its sum of squares. Material, the purple circle, gets its, but not including the ones that were already given to phosphate. And inter the interaction, again, gets the leftovers. So in this way, you will end up overestimating the significance of the factor listed first, it's being given, given in, in, in a sort of a colloquial sense, some of squares that are not actually influenced by that variable because some of that overlapping area should go to one and some to the other. But in this case, we either give it all to one or all to the other. So there's two alternative methods. First, if the interaction isn't significant, you can use something called the type two sum of squares. In it, each factor basically gets the sum of squares that is unique just to it, and that overlapping wedge is ignored and not given to anyone. So the material in purple gets the sum of squares for the material category after removing the part that is correlated with phosphate that overlaps. Likewise, phosphate gets its sum of squares after removing the overlapping portion with material. Now, if the interaction is significant, it gets more complicated. There's this type 3 sum of squares. And in it, each factor, as well as the interaction, are allocated the sum of squares unique just to that component. Any overlapping or shared sum of squares are ignored. So, for example, the sum of squares for material is that after accounting for the sum of squares for both phosphate and the interaction. And so, if you think, if you recall back to uh, multiple regression, 
this sounds quite similar because it in fact is exactly what multiple regression does. It looks at the effect of one variable after accounting for the effects of the other ones. Now both of these methods take a conservative approach. Type 3 is a bit more so than type 2. You can see that the purple and the orange circle areas are smaller in type 2 and even smaller in type 3. And this means that these methods will underestimate the statistical significance compared to what we could do if we could accurately partition the sum of squares. But that's the penalty for an unbalanced design. And it's considered to be better to be conservative in this way than to go the opposite direction, which would raise our risk of falsely finding statistical significance. So if you have an unbalanced design, beware of the standard R ANOVA functions and use alternatives with either type 2 or type 3 sum of squares, or use something called the general linear model, which I'll cover in a future video.